Welcome to the Galt Bird Festival. I'm John Muir Laws, and today I'm going to be showing you some really anal retentive, detail-y things about drawing birds. And so this is a really good addition to the class which we had earlier, um, where we're kind of just blocking in the basic shape of the bird. And but we ended up with kind of the silhouette of the bird, but none of the birdy details kind of fit in. So that's where this class comes in. We're going to take a look at two things. We're going to take a look at heads and we're going to look at um, wings. And um, we will, um, and, and, and this will, will give us some tools for being able to fill in those other parts of our bird drawings. The most important thing I'd say at the start is to block in that basic shape. If you miss that class, we recorded, recorded it and it will be available soon as a video on johnmirlaws.com. And um, it's, it's free, again, no, no paywall. Um, but you're going to, um, but, but so th this, otherwise would be like, you know, I've got some details on my head, but <clears throat> where do I put my head? <laughs> on the body. Um, so the, um, this, this does, just think of this as, a, um, as, as an addition um, or, or sort of the, the next phase after you've got that, that bird basically blocked out. We're going to kind of get into the head and um, we're going to put details on it. Otherwise, it, you know, when I started drawing birds, a lot of my birds looked like I kind of had a snowball with a carrot stuck in it. And that was my, 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 my bird head. Um, but there's the... There are patterns on a bird's face that um, are going to be consistent across a bunch of different species. So you don't have to memorize this different structure for like for sparrows versus warblers versus jays versus doves versus versus versus. Uh -uh. There's going to be this, this basic bird head formula. And um, we're going to play with that. And and put that on our, our birdies. So let's jump over to a share screen right now. And um, actually, I'm, <clears throat> I, I, I did a bunch of stuff on, on a keynote presentation um, earlier today and just sort of on the fly right now, I'm feeling more like just drawing freehand so I think rather than do this via a, 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 a PowerPoint presentation where I'm showing you pre-drawn lines, let's do this old school where, because now with the document camera, you can just look right down on my hands, we're going to draw this together. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the side view of a bird's head. And we are going to be blocking in these, these basic features and our bills. And think about how to kind of wrap our, 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 our brains around that. And then we're going to take a look at kind of thinking about the, the bird wing. That's going to be more fun for me. I think you're going to like it. And the PowerPoint presentation that I would have shown you is already available as a video on johnmirlaws.com. So this will be also, we'll throw in some new material because I love you. Here we go. There is my journal. Let's draw us some bird heads. Um, I'm going to start just with a, a simple circle here. And this is going to be a side view of my bird head. And down closer on that. So here's a little side view of my bird head. This is, I'm kind of blocking this in lightly, loosely. So if you're doing this, just say with a graphite pencil, um, go really lightly with these lines. I'm making them a little bit more bold here so they'll be easier for everybody to see. I put a little line across the head like this that's called my eye beak line. And this is where the eye and the beak are all lined up. The beak is going to be coming out here in the front. 
The center sort of suture between the upper and lower mandibles goes along that line there. And sometimes you'll see it kind of turn down a little bit when it hits the head, lower bill here. If I draw it like this, this is kind of a clear sort of diagrammatic thing. Sometimes it looks a little bit cartoony. As an illustrator, I kind of like this effect slightly better. Take a look at this. So to compare what I had before with if this line here, it doesn't quite kind of let it to sort of fade out as it approaches the tip of the beak. Very often, the suture between the upper and the lower is harder to see out here. This just kind of looks a little bit better. So very often when I'm just drawing a little bird beak, I'll, I'll just sort of, you know, I'll kind of start that line going out there, but, um, but I won't continue it all the way to the end. That's sort of a style thing. I think it looks better. Um, if your bird doesn't have big um, hairs around its nostrils, you'll sometimes see a little nostril in the upper beak like that. And the feathers of the head, um, here's what I used to do. I used to kind of, you know, here's my head and there's my beak, right? That's the snowman and carrot. But what I'm going to do is, let's zoom in on this even more. I am going to pooch these feathers out here from this little tip here, kind of into this a little bit like that. So these feathers are going to come into that bill and also here on the lower bill. Sometimes the feathers on the lower bill will stick out even further. like that. And now for the head and the chin, it's not going to be quite the way that you think. I can come from this point here. I'm going to kind of come up onto the head of the bird. But I'm not going to draw the chin down from this point here. The feathers on the chin come out a little ways onto the lower bill. So the lower bill feathers are going to come out there like that. Different birds have different shaped beaks. So on some birds, they have big seed eating beaks. A lot of those seed eating beaks, the little suture in the back of the mouth, there's a very sharp turn back at the corner of the mouth. Oops. Jack, could you uh, slide your page? There we go. Thanks. Sorry about that. But this beak shape is, it's a very important place to look on your birdie for making your birdie look like your birdie. <clears throat> now I'm going to show you a little kind of style point. Um, if your bird, you're looking at it straight in profile, you will get this effect here where this, where the, the, the feathers kind of come up right here from this point here on the top of the bill. But if the bird is looking towards you ever so slightly, what you're going to see is that the feathers on the far side of the head are going to come out here. So you actually see some feather going on the other. So the beak is actually coming into the head. When you draw it just like that, it just turns this head towards you ever so slightly. It's a cool effect rather than just a straight profile. So this bird is just turning its head towards you a little bit. So rather than have my top of my, my, my bird head here, I'm going to bring my side of my bird head in there. Now, let's mess with our bird eye. The bird eye goes on this line, not in the middle of the head. It's going to be closer to the front than you think it should be. 
So something that's very useful to do is there's a section of feathers right in here between the eye and the base of the beak called the lores, that's spelled L-O-R-E-S. And what I do is I wanna look at the length of that, that distance there, those lores, and then I'm gonna put my, my eye in. For a better bird eye, I'll show you just a, a fun little trick on this. Um, the eye is wet. Very often there is an iris that's a different color than the black pupil, and there's also a reflection of light on it. So I will very often very lightly kind of trace in where my reflected light is going to be. And underneath that, I'm going to put in my pupil. And that I can make dark. And then I'm going to shade in that iris, except where the highlight is. And that gives you a very kind of light sparkling on the eye looking back at you look. Um, if this bird is deep under the canopy, there won't be a nice crisp highlight like this. There'll be some sort of filtered pattern, some little speckles of light. If it's in a really dark place where there's no light directly hitting the eye, there's not going to be a highlight. So there's not always a highlight. But um, this is uh, a little bit of light in that eye really makes that bird feel a little bit more alive. Now, Let's put a few features onto the head of this bird. Um, I, first let me check my audio here. Good. I am one moment. I'm going to uh, show you a few very common patterns and features on the heads of birds that you'll see across species and just make the head of your bird just look a little bit more alive. First, there is a zone of small feathers around the eye. And that is called the eye ring. And sometimes you'll see kind of a few more kind of extra layers of that, especially under the eye, that kind of make the bird look a little bit sleepy. This eye ring or these ocular feathers, they can be a different color um, or they can be the same color as the rest of the bird, just to kind of make these um, show up a little bit more clearly. I'm just gonna take some yellow paint here and paint these in so that we can keep track of these different parts of our head. That's my eye ring, or my ocular feathers. Then the bird has an ear that is down here. It's a little hole in the side of the cheek. But that's covered up by a patch of feathers that comes back from the center of the eye here and then it arcs down along the side of the face like this. And it comes back um, up here. And it connects, there's a little bit, sometimes a little bit of a dip down like that, um, to the corner of the mouth. And these feathers are a little bit more stiff and bristly. And um, even if the bird's head is all one color, you'll often see this called an ear patch that is a, it's, it's a zone of more bristly feathers over the ear so that sound is not attenuated as it comes over you know, into the, the, the ear of the bird.
below the ear patch and connect, you see this little groove right here in the, where the, the feathers come up into the lower bill. You can even, you know, on some birds that will even pooch out even more like that. This lines up with a row of feathers that's inserted over the bird's jaw, lower jaw or malar. And this is the malar region. And I'm going to make that pink. And that can occupy this whole space right in there. That's our malar. Between the eye and the beak in the rest of this space here, there is a zone of feathers, bristly feathers in here called the lores. We already mentioned that, but let's give them some color. Um, the lores occupy that space right in there and they are um, looking at that distance is really helpful. And very often there's a little bit of shading in here um, or dark feathers that kind of makes, kind of gives the bird a little bit of an angry bird's look. I'm going to come over here on the top of the head and make another section of feathers that comes out from back here. And it's going to kind of pooch out here in the back of the neck. this little kind of pooch out zone here. That is what's called the nape. The bird's nape is back there. And you will often see sort of a change in the angle on the back of the head where those nape feathers come down and meet the back. So there's not going to have a smooth line over the back of the head. I actually want to trim this down a little bit here. So we'll come down then hit the nape and then pooch out. These specific zones of feathers right here are the ones that I really suggest that people pay attention to and focus on because if you get these zones, um, you'll find on the head of a bird that is all one color, you will find little hints of the edges of these feather tracks. They'll make lines and sutures on the face of the bird because of the way that the feathers come out, even if it's all, say, an olive head. So let's just do that right now. I'm going to draw a little bird head down here, and we'll put kind of a suggestion of these zones in subtly. So here is my, my sort of my, my start and I'm going to draw So here's my eye. So I'm going to put in a little, just a hint of an eye ring, not like a bold line going all the way around, but just to sort of say like, look, there is an eye ring in here. So some places you see it stronger than others. I'm going to add a little bit of a shadow in here in this lores area, kind of connecting that beak with the eye. So that it, it sort of joins the beak with the eye and makes that section just look like they, they, they fit together. There is a little bit of an ear patch down here. And I'm going to show that it's kind of, and I don't have to draw it as a line coming all the way up to there, but I want to know where that goes, where it peters out. And then this line right here on the bottom of the malar, I'm just going to start that and then fade it out. So there's just a hint of those patterns 
in that bird head. And notice this little slight bump here on the back of the head. And if I were to add <clears throat> color to this, let's say that this is a fairly dull warbler without strong patterns on it. Um, going to come along here. I can draw right over those. They still are just going to give me a little bit of a sense of the the structure that's down there. And on the end of this ear patch, I'm going to kind of fade that in a little bit more. Now I've got a little bit of I've got a little bit of brown on my brush with mixed with a little bit of green, so that's going to make for a little bit of a kind of shadow up there in that lores. Might put a hint of a kind of more of a shadow right back there. Put some around the edge of that eye, back here where the nape meets the back. And then I am going to, here's that little suture in the middle of the mouth. And I now have less paint on my brush tip. And there you go. and I will give it a bit of a darker eye. So that gives me just a little bit of, the, the eye's just not floating there in the head. It's attached by these lores. It's the the throat and this part they're they're connecting into structure. If this bird has a little bit of texture and pattern on its head, I'm going to put a bit of that in. So I'm just going to test my colors off here. Got a little bit of brownish uh, mixed with some green here, and. Sometimes in the nape. There are little feathers. I'm going to put in a hint of an eye line here. Patterns on the birds will often be right kind of along the edges of these sort of stripes and zones. So it has an, a dark, this bird will have a dark bar through its eye. I'm gonna strengthen that in front of the eye here. And what kind of a bird is this? Uh, I have no idea, I'm making this bird up but I'm sort of putting in sorts of patterns that you see on lots of different birds. Um, and 
let's put in just a little suggestion of some texture. No, probably better off if I don't. Um, something that I, I do want to do, I'm going to come down here under its eye. Remember those sort of bags that I mentioned under making the bird look a little bit sleepy? I'm going to put a hint of that. And notice how when I'm, before I'm brushing with my brush here, I'm just testing things off on the side of my paper. I'm going to come underneath this, come under here. That sort of attaches my, my head into there a little bit more. One final thing I'm going to do on this, some birds, the feathers around the eyes, here you can kind of just see that hint of that eye ring, so sometimes it appears like that. Other times, what you're going to see is that there are, the feathers in that are differently colored. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this bird what's called a broken eye ring. I have a gel pen here that allows me to draw white. And so the broken eye ring kind of gives you these eye arcs effect. Find that on some warblers. And there we go. I'm going to hold off here. This sort of imaginary bird is sort of slightly warblerly features, vireo features. But I've just been using this as a way of showing kind of the relationships between these patterns very clear in the diagram and then how they might appear on the side of a head of a real bird that's hopping around in your garden. And you can do the same with the wing. Um, so I'm now going to turn to, to looking at the wing and the structure of the wing. Let's back up a little bit. Right. Um, Here's my little bird body. If you're in our previous class, you know, we kind of drew in the, the, the back of a bird. We blocked in its head. We gave it a little bit of a chest shape, blocked in some body, tails, foreheads. And for the wing, we were just making a little line along the side of the body. Sometimes the, I like to think of like where in here, let's zoom more on that so that uh, occupies more of your screen. Whip, whip. All right, so where in here does the wing start? Does it start over here? Does it start here? Does it start here? There, it actually is going to be different on different birds depending on how it has folded its wing up against its body. So the same individual bird it would be correct to draw the wing starting here and here and here, right? So there's a whole area in here that your wing edge can start from and still be absolutely accurate. So I'm gonna start mine here and my wing is going to come back. Sometimes they droop down below the body here. Sometimes they droop back, they kind of tuck up onto the back here. I'm gonna draw this one eh, kind of in the middle. So there's the leading edge of my wing. And then I, there's a pile of feathers in the back of the wing. And I just want to kind of look at where does that pile of feathers stop? Those pile of feathers are called the secondary feathers. And um, <clears throat> they change the contour of this, of, of, of the wing. Um, they, in turn, kind of wrap up at an angle. There's sort of a triangular pad of feathers up here, back feathers and scapular feathers on the bird that makes the top edge of the wing kind of a little bit of an angle. And so if I'm making kind of a simplified bird wing here, uh, actually, let me just block in a little bit more of this bird so that it 
just starts to look a little bit more birdie for us. Here's the edge of my nape. Right. And then it's going to have its little birdie tail here. <clears throat> so I want to, to get kind of a simple wing on the side of this body. Note the overall shape. There's a straight leading edge. It's going to be an arc across the back here. You want to think of this pad of feathers that is coming down here as sort of being a triangular wedge. And if the wing is folded up really tightly on itself, you'll see that continued all the way down to the, the rump. So you can have that going down further. But here it's going to be blocked by this, by this wing. Um, this edge of the wing, there is, it's going to go down and there's going to be a step. That step is the boundary between what are called the primary and the secondary feathers. So a very simple wing shape here is just going to be this secondary feather step out to a point here and up to the corner of your wing. And sometimes when I'm drawing birds, that's exactly where I stop. So let me I'm going to grab a journal. Let's just take a look at some, some bird wings in my sketchbook here. And do, 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 do. All right. So check out some of these little birds. So on quick little bird sketches, this is a great way to just kind of go about it. Like look at look at this one here. I've just sort of drawn an oval here with some little primary feathers sticking out. Um, what about over here? I've got this bump coming down to the, pro to the, the secondary step. Oops, I'm not on the screen. Let's try that again. The secondary step and then out to the tip of the feathers there. This bird right up here, hello, I'm a paradise flycatcher. You kind of this um, Elvis Presley um, crest from the front. Um, so what's going on with its wing? We have just a box here of secondary feathers and the primary feathers sticking out here. Also in this, you can see up in here, I've drawn a little line coming across here. There's a small section up here of smaller feathers called covert feathers that take up this top corner of the wing. And on some birds, those have very bold edges. If birds have wing bars, that's where you'll see the wing bar. But this little area here, I'm just kind of suggesting that that is, there's that section in there. You see the same sort of thing going on here on this bird. Here's that secondary step. And here's a suggestion of where those, um, the wing ends. And here's the, the edge of those covert feathers. Very often on a distant bird, I'm not seeing feather, feather, feather detail. Yeah, it's a zebra, but. So here is a bird, um, the gray beak sparrow. And check out what it's going, what's going on in it. It has, I'm just trying to draw the secondary step and down here to the point of the wing. Up here, those are my covert feathers. So this bird actually has some more interesting covert feathers. And I want to get just a few other examples of simple wings. Um, you're hiding your wing from us. All right, here's one more kind of not putting very much detail in. Here is, whoops, here's a simple wing. So what I'm, I've got is my, my wing is gonna start somewhere up in here. I'm coming down, here's that secondary step. 
Here's the tip of the feathers. The primary feathers are often darker than the secondaries. They'll have more melanin in it, which is a strengthening pigment. And then a straight edge coming up there. Right in here, I have just a suggestion that I have covert feathers going up into there. So um, on my little bird front here, if I want to make this a little bit fancier, I can just sort of say like, you know, hey, it's got, it's got some covert feathers. And those are up in that area there. And for a, you know, a quick little bird sketch, Oh, um, question is like when I'm talking about the secondary step, what I'm meaning is that as you come back down the edge of this wing, I'll do, do this a little bit more bold, right here, clunk, that is, there's this change in angle. It steps down so that the wing is not coming back like this to a point. It's coming down, there's a step, and then to the point of the wing. Right? Uh, so that is, that's a very kind of useful, fast birdie wing. And for a lot of the distances where I'm observing birds, um, that level of detail in the wings is really, I'm, I'm not seeing feather, 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 all these, these like, you know, a close up high resolution photograph. I've got a little bird, little bird, and I'm seeing that it's got a block of secondary feathers with some primaries sticking out. So another way I've seen people that, that you can handle this is when you're thinking about the wing and kind of the, the quick and dirty wing. Um, if here is my bird body. Just gonna look over here. And this is gonna have a droopy wing. Um, Right, so it's going to have a wing somewhere in that area. It's going to be drooping down. Um, check this this kind of quick and dirty wing. I'm going to just draw a little oval in here. Now that's my secondaries. There are my primaries sticking down. Edge of the covert feathers. And top of the wing would be right in there. So this sort of approach is great because I'm not getting lost in the weeds of like, you know, there's, you know, here are all my little tertial feathers and these feathers overlap this way and these feathers overlap this way. When you're looking out in your garden at that bird hopping around, sometimes you're just, you're just barely able to see like, look, it's kind of got, like if you can see that there's dark, you know, um, that it has primary and, and secondary feathers, you're doing really well. So this is just a, a very useful strategy for getting a kind of a quick wing. If I want to take it a little bit further and add some color or value to it, what I'm going to do is often make the primaries themselves a little bit darker. Because again, they will often have melanin in the tips so that those longest points of the wings don't kind of hit other things and fray quite as much. Let's just jump back here. And I'll take a look around at a bunch of different birds and see if there are some uh, cooperative birds. I'm going to look for birds that are kind of in a side view. Oh, I know which journal I should grab. Meantime, I will put this simplified wing. Oh, no detail. Interesting. All right, yeah, here's a here's a journal that has a bunch of bird sketches in it. Let's just take a look around here at what is kind of going on with with wings and heads. So take a look at this birdie here. So you see how what's going on here, things that I want to kind of highlight, is that we have the outer edge of the head coming around. Not, so you're not seeing the beak in a total profile. 
again, it gives you this bird is looking towards you slightly look. Because this edge of this line comes around here. There's my ring around the eye. Here is my ear patch. And you see that little nape bump right back there. Let's take a look at this bird's head. There you see that ring around the eye, the ear patch. Here is that malar zone. And the feathers coming out under the chin. So for very different types of birds, those same little principles apply. Um, if I am so far away, whoop, so far away from the bird that I cannot see the details of how that head is attaching into the beak, I don't draw it. So these birds have no eyes. They have no beak, uh, no, no kind of uh, sort of change where, where the beak comes in. So if you don't see it, you don't have to draw it. A lot of sort of field sketching, what I'm gonna do with my heads and my beaks and the details, it has to do with what details can I actually see from that distance, whether I'm using a, um, a, 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 a telescope, my binoculars, or just a cooperative bird in front of me. Hey, Jack, these um, are really awesome um, um, tips that you're giving us as, as bird watchers and wanting to draw birds. Um, I just want to give you a time check. It's We've got about 15 minutes till the end. OK, great. Um, so I am um, in, in other classes. If you go to johnmuirlaws.com, you can see classes where I kind of I get in there and feather by feather, we diagram out the wings. Um, but what I am finding that I usually am doing when I am sketching wings is I am just blocking in that basic shape using the techniques which I've shown you here. And you really don't need to show all that level of detail which you're usually not seeing even from a medium distance. If you have a, you know, a really big lens on a camera, yeah, you might get some of those sorts of, of other sorts of details. But take a look at, you know, this little birdie down here. And there is, we're kind of coming down, we're seeing the step right here down to the point. Here is just a little suggestion of the edge of my covert feathers. And there is the my back of my bird. So uh, don't worry about showing detail that you don't understand and can't even see. Oh, check this out. On these little mask uh, tatiras, I could see my scapular feathers and stuff, and I couldn't really see any detail in the wing. Or maybe those were, um, those could even be, uh, might have had gray secondaries, but I can't really tell, make a differentiation between that when I was out there in the field, so I just didn't draw it. But what I saw was just sort of a zone in there of dark. Those are definitely primary feathers. So the, 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 the really nice thing is that you get to draw what you see. Draw what you see. Check out this wing here. There's my secondary feather step down to the point. Um, here is a, here's a little warbler and look at how little detail is going into that wing. So it helps to understand the basic structure of the wing, what you're looking at, and then be able to let that go and just draw what you see from the distance that you are, that you're, 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 you're looking at. The same is true of feet. You can't really see what's going on on the feet of your bird, 
I don't draw those feet. So this is a simplification of um, oh, so here, what, what I originally did when I started drawing bird wings is I learned every feather in here, every part of the wing feather by feather. I actually suggest that you do do that. It's a great exercise and it will help your bird wings. But then what I want to do is to back off and not put in all that detail because I'm not seeing it. Let me show you what um, a, kind of a, a good example of why not to do that. And here is this book and so why I think suggesting detail is so powerful is because your drawings end up looking a lot more like the critter. This is Field Guide by David Allen Sibley. Sibley's Guide to Birds. Sibley, I think, is a crazy genius mind. Um, so what he did on his birds is he drew them with the level of a detail that, would, that you would see looking at the birds from your regular birding distance. So they don't have a whole bunch of detail in on them that you can't see. So um, the, make this kind of go to a, a warbler here. Jack, there, there's a, a question here. Um, you know, we're, we're learning how to draw ad advanced details in birds and, and someone was, was wondering if um, during the next 10 minutes you can show us some pictures of your early birds to get a, get a sense of the progression. Yeah, oh, that would be fun. We could do that. Um, let, let's go, but first let me just, uh, with, with uh, Sibley's book here, let me just show you something cool. Um, this, I, when, when, I, when I realized what he was doing, I just made, made me realize like, yes, that's the right way to make, to make a field guide. Um, so what Sibley has, what Sibley is doing here is <clears throat> there is, you're seeing on this wing, you're not seeing kind of the edges of all the feathers. Sibley knows exactly where the edges of all these feathers are, but he's just suggesting some out here in this little primary tip that's sticking out, but you're seeing just kind of, see there's the secondary step and this thing pointing out, a little bit of detail in there. What I did when I was making my field guide is, um, I was so wrapped up in kind of understanding the structure of all of these, these wings and feathers that I would get in there. Let me kind of find a page that's a good example of this. Yeah, this is a great example. Um, so look at this wing here. And do you see how I am drawing in the edges of every feather? And then you've got these big, bold black lines between the edges of those feathers. Now, um, all these feathers are accurately placed relative to each other. The way that they are overlapping is the way that they overlap on the bird. However, when you look at the real bird, you're not seeing this grid of black lines everywhere on the bird. You are seeing... Um, much more like Sibley is doing, the sort of these shapes, and then a hint of detail here and there. So I think that one of the, the genius moves uh, that he's doing here is to not put in detail that we can't see, but that we know is there, right? Um, and the result is something that looks much more like that bird. So that's why I'm um, partly through the inspiration of looking at Sibley stuff, moving my work more in the direction of 
um, showing showing the amount of information that I can actually see from that place in the field. But I still want to know what those feathers are and how they overlap, but then not over showing. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to go on a time warp here. This is 2018, this journal that you're looking at. This is 2018. And um, I am then going to go over to my cabinet and I'm going to pull out some journals from kind of going back in time. So I'm going to grab a 20. I'm going to get a 2014. I'm going to go back. Let's see what can we do here. 2009, that will be nice. Um, 2000. Let's go for 1994. Let's go for 1985. All right. So here's a John Muir Law's time warp coming at you. Um, so going back a little ways in time, uh, this is 2014. Um, and uh, so there is, there's a, there's a, a nice, simplified wing. Say that the, uh, the way that the beak is fitting into the head is a little bit off, but uh, I like that simplified wing. This is a better kind of beak into the head. Um, and there's not a lot of other birds in there. Um, so going back further in time, let's go for, that was, actually, though, no, this is more. Let's go for 2009, 2009. Um, here is an osprey um, suggesting some wing detail. Places where it's in the light, kind of giving some of those hard shadows on the edges of feathers. Um, this here on this bird, I think what I'm really doing in here is kind of showing, like, look, I know where all these feathers go. But I'm pretty sure when I was looking at that, I would not have been seeing all those feather edges. But in my head, I was kind of mapping out the way I thought it was supposed to be. Um, here is another little bird. Um, and if you look at there in that wing, I'm drawing in all the edges of the feathers where I know that they're supposed to be. But on a, a, a bird like this, I probably wasn't actually seeing those edges of color. So I was taking my understanding of bird wing, making it up and superimposing that on top of the details of the bird that I was seeing. And I mean, that's not, it's not that it's, you know, such a bad thing and big deal, but um, you do get these things that, you know, you kind of, the bird looks less like the bird. Um, There's some detail suggested in here and some left to your imagination. 
It's okay. Here, I'm, I think, kind of going overboard on hyper diagramming all the information that I think that I know is there. And look, like I know that, like I, like I know that the, the greater sec, uh, secondary coverts overlap this way and the median secondary coverts overlap in the opposite direction. I was so pleased with knowing that little bit of information that I'm showing it to you here in this drawing. But when I would have been looking at this bird in the field, that is not what I would have seen even through a telescope because the edges of these feathers would be sort of more smooth together. I would not be seeing this little diagram of bird plumage. So I think that that's, um, so I'm now trying to, to get, I want to understand that yes, they overlap this way, but I want to, in my drawing, have the curves to show less than I know. Hey Jack, I'm just giving you a time check. We have two minutes till the end. Okay. Um, here we go in 2000. Um, some gnat catchers with some strange proportions. Um, but uh, I do like that simplified wing there. Let me see here. Um, that's kind of fun. There is a simplified little falcon wing sitting on top of a saguaro cactus. Um, I like that approach. That's, that's a reasonable amount of detail that I actually would have been seeing from that distance. Right. See, there it is. There's, there's, there's the little birdie up there. Um, now let's just jump back to 1994. Um, oh, this was when I was doing my master's thesis. <laughs> this is fun. Uh, this will be cool. Um, so what I was doing is I would go up with my telescope on top of a mountain, and I was looking at um, I was looking at birds through the telescope. And so these are all kind of scope driven things. And these are little notes about how to tell different individual birds apart by, by plumage characteristics. So this one here had big spots, brown back, uh, brown eyebrow. Uh, can you slide diffuse... that page up just a little? Oh, that's right, we can't see it. All right, so you see lots of written notes in with these. These ones I wouldn't have had time to, to color in. Others. You know, uh, here's ones that are a little bit more colored in. Um, uh, let's see if we can get any other birds. These are kind of fun. Um, I like this level of, uh, there we go, this kind of light level of detail on this bird that's moving and flipping around, kind of preening its wing. The level of detail can relate to and correspond to how cooperative the birds are. Then when I was in college, I thought that what I was supposed to do is go out and draw, I draw it in pencil and then erase all of my lines and, um, try, and go over it with pen and then erase my lines. Um, so things had a very kind of static look to them. Here, it's clear that I don't really understand what the feathers are and how they overlap. And um, let me see, just, ah, yep, <clears throat> here is, uh, so yeah, my approach back in these days was I would see a bird, I would draw it with my pencil, 
I would then go over that with ink. I would erase my pencil and then put my colored pencil in on top of it. And lastly, we're going to go to 1985. So this would have been my, my first year in college. It gets better with practice. And the more you do it on a regular basis, the faster that comes. Um, I wish I had a bunch of the shortcuts that I have now um, then, because um, a lot of these techniques really help me be able to get those shapes down fast and accurately. Um, but it's, uh, it's a ton of fun. And again, you don't want to get wrapped around the axle about whether it's a pretty picture or not. Um, the, you know, I'm, I'm learning something from doing these things. Here I've got notes. New call heard today instead of the normal uh, chip. Uh, it's a solitary tit that, uh, or a solitary tit um, uh, made by a solitary tit. This one made a warbling trill that lasted about three seconds. So a bush tit making a warbling trill. I hadn't heard the bush tit do that before. And so I thought that that was, was really cool. So anything that I'm observing, noticing, wondering, even back then, it's going down in that book. So um, there is a, a few thoughts about getting our bird shapes down on paper, a little bit about knowing the structure and then being able to back off and not show everything you know. Because otherwise the drawing just ends up looking, you, you, you are making this map of what is in your head of what you think it should be rather than what you're actually seeing. I think it's great to study the wings and to study the way that the feathers overlap and to study all the details of you know, the head feather by feather. David Allen Sibley will sit there, find a dead bird and get out his tweezers and just pluck that thing and look at where each feather comes from. And the results are that you know, he's just, he's like bird drawing Yoda. Um, but then he can back off and not show everything that he knows. It's brilliant. I hope that some of these strategies are helpful for you in your bird drawing. I've got more resources and tips on my website, which is johnmirlaws.com if you wanna go there and check those out. Um, I also want to encourage you to join any of the free weekly classes that I am offering. So you can find all about that at my website. In addition, there's a wonderful community of nature journalers. Um, who are um, who are are leading um, who are sharing their work and many other um, folks who are also um, sharing their uh, what they know with the community leading workshops. We've got two of those folks on the call with us today, and I'm going to go um, pop them on because you should know about these if you want to do this. Um, you ought to meet um, Ibea Moore. And you ought to meet Melinda Nakagawa, um, the uh, <clears throat> Melinda. Um, uh, actually, I was just I'm asked both of you just sort of give uh, just a quick word about like if people want to connect with you, you want to kind of get you some more journaling on, but you need some support, um, and you're feeling I, I want to do this, but I'm a little bit scared. Like how did I do it? These two folks are an amazing tag team that will help you get there. Um, uh, who wants to lead off? Melinda. All right, 
Well, thanks, Jack, uh, for an amazing class, um, for learning the, the details of birds. And if you want to continue learning how to nature journal uh, with a great community, you come to Sunday mornings at 930 Pacific time. I have a free Monterey Bay Nature Journal Club sessions every Sunday. I've, I just put the link, I'll put the link here in the um, chat, but you can go to the events calendar and find out what the topic is and come anytime. Nature journaling is something to do with the community and you improve your ability to observe, your, your learning tips and strategies on how to get what you see on the page and deepen your experience. So come join us. Um, and Avea is going to talk about um, what she does too. Thanks. Melinda, thank you for what you do for the community. And um, I lead this thing that happens on Friday mornings at nine in the morning Pacific time and Saturdays at three. So in less than an hour um, and it's called pencil miles and chill. And our goal is we gather together online on zoom with our journals. We can draw, we can finish up old pages. We can chat, we can do investigations, whatever. And the idea is to get all of those pencil miles in and most importantly, to have a supportive community together. So we have wonderful conversations. You meet some of the most wonderful people and everybody's invited. I'll post that link as well. And you can always find it in the event section on the Nature Journal Club page. Thank you. Thank you. So oh, places to get, get support and practice to engage with community. You know, the community ends up being a really important part of this. And I just maybe in, in closing, just say something about that. Um, you know, for instance, the, the research on uh, people who want to quit smoking or to, um, to, to, to people who go on a, on a diet, people will try to do these sorts of things and then it doesn't work. Uh, we make these goals and then we don't meet them. Um, if, however, you're doing it with your partner and you're doing something in community and together, people actually have a really high success rate. That's one of the reasons why programs like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous are really successful because they know that if you make a community around something, those people support each other to help break the habits that they don't want to have. Well, they, here, this is a community that helps you develop the habits that you do want to have. And it works the same way. So when you engage with these folks, it, um, it makes it so much more possible and fun to meet your goals and objectives. And you don't feel like I'm alone trying to figure out how to do this. So I really want to encourage people to you know, consider this. It's a, um, Melinda and Avea have really built beautiful supportive communities and you kind of get connected all of, with all of that over on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page. None of us are really like Facebook people who like want to be you know, Facebooking, but it's ended up being a, a useful place for us to share information, to share journal pages. There's some 18,000 people all around the world sharing their journal pages and bird sketches and sketches of the slug and diagrams of the, um, the relationship of the, the, the dew to the rainbow that they found outside their house this morning. And um, it's an inspiring, um, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an inspiring place. So for both of you, thank for you for what you're doing for this community. I also want to just send a shout out to the city of Galt. Thank you folks so much for um, inviting ecotourism into your community and uh, really helping the, the community as a whole see that a healthy, thriving, wild community around us really helps support us economically and, and the, 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 the fabric of our city. For people who are birders, I really recommend that consider checking out um, local birding festivals near you, like the one that the wonderful one that they have at the, the city of, of, of Galt. Um, when we show up for these things, we are, um, we're, we're, we're showing by putting our, 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 our money down and staying in the hotels and places around the community during these festivals that um, ecotourism makes sense. And that actually makes a big, big gains for, um, for arguments for conservation in a lot of these places. Um, and also you're going to be have opportunities to meet with wonderful um, leaders, coordinators, inspirational naturalists who will help you be able to, um, to take your skills to a higher level. Uh, soon we'll be in person again, 
And in the meantime, stay safe and, um, and be kind. Um, I hope you find lots of opportunities for getting out in nature and, and playing together. Thank you so much for being here. Actually, before you, we, we sign off, Jack, I just wanted to say um, on behalf of the community, thank you so much for all that you do, not just today teaching us how to see better um, birds in a better light and improve our skills and confidence as nature journalers and bird enthusiasts and nature draw drawers, but just your, um, your commitment and generosity and passion is so clear and we feel it all. And we are so deeply grateful for your time, love and commitment. So let's give Jack a round of applause and send him, send him our love. We Thank love you, Jack. We do, your kindness. Your kindness inspires us all not to just be better nature journalists, but to just be better people in general. So thank you for that. Always, always thank you for that. I really appreciate that. I really do. It means it means so much to me. These um, actually are um, very challenging times for me right now. And being a part of this beautiful community, um, uh, this 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 blessed community makes me um, makes me stronger. It makes me who I am. So um, it it all comes around. Um, it's wonderful that we can be there for each other and um, help each other. We got each other's backs, definitely. Thank you. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for being here.